If you were to visit Niagara Falls a century ago, you'd find a landscape shaped less by tourism and more by industry. Indeed, the falls were already a major attraction, but their primary value lay in the power that they could generate. That's right, for decades, this area has functioned as one of North America's most important energy hubs. Beginning in the mid 19th century, companies on both sides of the border diverted the river into a series of engineered channels, shafts, and underground conduits. And these massive tunnels were dug directly into the rock. These utilities supplied a range of things like mills, factories, chemical works, and later, some of the first AC power plants. But here's the curious thing. Most of that infrastructure is no longer in use, since as technology advanced and control of the river changed hands, entire tunnel networks were just sealed off, flooded, and abandoned. Meaning today, visitors now stand above vast sections of urban decay that really they'd never know existed. So how did one of the world's most recognizable natural landmarks end up with a forgotten tunnel system beneath it? And what exactly remains down there? Stay tuned to find out as we explore the abandoned tunnels of Niagara Falls. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Let's start with the earliest known European records of Niagara Falls, dating back to 1678, when French explorer Father Louis Hennepin published one of the earliest descriptions of the site. He described the falls as a, quote, frightful and astonishing waterfall where the river throws itself down an enormous height. His account went on to stress the power of the falls above all else, calling them the most recognizable feature he had seen in North America. A potent description and a notion that many in the coming years would agree with. For the next two centuries, the falls remained a geographic landmark rather than an industrial resource, with small settlements forming on both the American and Canadian sides. Though that changed in the mid-19th century, when the US and British Canada began viewing the river as a controllable source of mechanical power. In other words, change was on the horizon. The first major step came in 1853, when the Falls Hydraulic Power and Manufacturing Company began construction of its hydraulic canal on the American side. Completed in 1861, it fed water to the early mills and laid the groundwork for the subsequent industrial expansions to come. And it didn't take long for additional industries to join, such as paper mills, flour milling, chemical processing, and so on. These formed the first concentrated manufacturing district at Niagara Falls. Though it didn't last long, as by the 1880s, attention shifted once again from mechanical water power to electricity. And the question on everyone's mind was how to turn the energy at Niagara into long distance electrical transmission. This debate unfolded during the so-called War of Currents, putting Thomas Edison's direct current system against the alternating current system of Nikola Tesla and George Westinghouse. Though this matter was partially resolved by 1890 when the International Niagara Commission, chaired by Lord Kelvin, solicited proposals from the most viable system to harness the river at scale. And in 1893, the contract was ultimately awarded to Westinghouse Electric using Tesla's AC design. Construction of the Adams Power Plant No. 1 began shortly thereafter, and on August the 26th, 1895, the station began transmitting locally. By November the 16th, 1896, power from Niagara was successfully delivered as far away as Buffalo. That was 26 miles. Proof that AC could support industrial development far beyond the falls. Though once the contract was awarded, the supplier had to deal with an interesting challenge. You see, once AC demonstrated reliability, companies on both sides of the border pursued larger generating stations. These facilities required controlled water flow and stable discharge routes, which in turn demanded substantial underground works. So-called tail race tunnels became the preferred solution. Conduits cut through the bedrock to return used river water without disturbing the surface land. With that, by the early 20th century, the underground industrialization of Niagara Falls was underway. The first substantial subterranean works began with the hydraulic canal project in 1853. Still, the real engineering took place not in the canal itself, rather in the mill race tunnels cut into the rock at the southern end. When crews began excavation, they dug through layers of Lockport dolomite and the underlying shales, 
carving a connected series of stone-lined conduits that fed the water from the canal into the industrial wheel pits. Although these tunnels were small compared to the hydraulic tunnels that came later, they were significant for their time, typically 8 to 12 feet high and just wide enough for maintenance workers to enter. Some sections were hand cut with chisels and picks, whereas others were shaped by early blasting powders. The water entered each tunnel through gated openings from the canal, and the mill operators controlled these gates manually, adjusting the volume of water feeding the wheel pits as needed. The tunnels then sloped downward towards the gorge, allowing gravity to accelerate the current before it struck the wheels. After powering the wheels, the discharge water flowed through yet another network of smaller tunnels and shafts, eventually entering into the river below through stone outfalls built directly into the gorge walls. At their height, the system supported a tightly packed arrangement of industrial wheel pits, and in some cases, the tunnels had to be expanded or reshaped as the mills upgraded their equipment. The effect was a creation of a patchwork of interconnected passages beneath the factories. These tunnels operated continuously for decades, but their decline was predictable. Remember, wheel pits were abandoned when mills switched to electrical equipment in the 1890s, and as if overnight, water-powered machinery was dismantled, leaving the underground chambers empty. Though here's the thing, without proper upkeep, the tunnels began to clog, often causing damage not only to the tunnels but also to the factory above them. Thus, by the 1920s, maps of the district already showed significant portions of the system marked as disused or in ruin. The canal still flowed, but its underground works were already becoming artifacts. So when the final round of industrial redevelopment struck the area in the 1930s and 40s, many of the surviving tunnels were deliberately filled with rubble to stabilize building foundations, or they were just buried as the land was regraded. With that being said, in modern times, ground penetrating surveys have indeed identified intact sections beneath modern warehouse lots. These caverns appear in imagery as arched voids consistent with 19th century construction, but other than that, no public access point remains. Furthermore, the original discharge points along the gorge are either collapsed or buried behind later retaining structures. Hence, no above ground structure marks their existence. And although the mill tunnels were widely lost before the turn of the century, there would be much larger structures to come, as electricity required far greater industrial scale. The tailrace tunnel beneath Adams Power Plant No. 1 was a dramatic leap in subterranean engineering. Excavation began in 1890, shortly after Westinghouse secured the contract to build the world's very first full-scale AC hydroelectric station. The generating hall itself was important, but the tunnel below it was the critical element that made the entire plant viable. To accomplish that, engineers had to carve a 1,400-foot discharge tunnel through the gorge wall cutting downward at a controlled gradient so that the spent water could exit beneath the plant rather than flood its machinery. The work was done using a combination of hand drilling or controlled dynamite charges and proved to be very difficult. Harder sections needed extensive drilling, with the shale required careful reinforcement to prevent flanking and collapse. In the end, this tunnel was approximately 18 to 20 feet high and wide enough for multiple flow channels with a horseshoe-shaped cross-section that balanced hydraulic efficiency with structural strength. Beyond that, its upstream end connected directly to the plant's 12 vertical penstocks, which dropped the water into turbines located deep beneath the generating hall. Once the turbines extracted energy from the flow, the tailrace carried the water away at high velocity, discharging it through an outlet cut into the lower gorge. Now, to manage pressure and maintain the gradient, builders installed temporary timber bracing, which they later replaced with brick and stone linings in vulnerable areas. When everything was said and done, the tailrace could move tens of thousands of gallons per second and without interrupting operations above. And not only was the tunnel amazing, but when Adams No. 1 became operational in 1895, that tailrace became the backbone of the very first long distance High voltage AC transmission in history. As on November the 16th of that same year, electricity generated above the tunnel reached Buffalo, 26 miles away. The achievement was reported internationally. Tesla's theories were vindicated. Westinghouse gained dominance in electrical infrastructure, and the Adams Tunnel became the unseen artery 
defeating the most influential power system of its era. For over six decades, the tunnel remained in continuous use, performing reliably year after year, even as the generating hall above it required upgrades and maintenance. But this was not to last forever, as the geopolitical landscape of the falls was shifting. By the late 1940s and 50s, U.S.-Canadian water treaties shifted control of the river, and new public works, most notably the Robert Moses plant, with its deeper, more efficient tunnels, began generating far more power than the early stations. And just like that, by 1961, the old plant was decommissioned. The pen stocks were sealed, the turbines shut down, and tail race intake was blocked with reinforced concrete. With no water moving through it, the tunnel filled slowly with groundwater and seepage. In time, it became a flooded chamber, preserved only by the strength of the surrounding rock. Today, the Adams Station building still stands near the American Falls, a preserved brick landmark with its original architectural presence still intact. And although no modern utility uses them, the tunnels are still down there. On the Canadian side, the most ambitious tunneling project of the early 20th century started in 1904, when the Ontario Power Company built a generating station right next to the Horseshoe Falls. Unlike the earlier American works, this project relied heavily on coordinated underground excavation. Engineers opened multiple headings simultaneously, driving crews into the bedrock from the intake portals near the river's edge, as well as from deep access shafts positioned along the proposed tunnel line. Though the geology presented a set of distinct challenges, those different than we found on the US side. Basically, the upper layers of dolomite were solid enough to support large span tunnels, but beneath them, bands of softer shale demanded careful reinforcement. To maintain stability, engineers altered between exposed bedrock sections and areas lined with concrete bricks. The result was a main tunnel of over 2,000 feet in length, with lateral branches feeding 15 turbine draft tubes in the powerhouse. Flow control was handled by a system of steel gates positioned at the intakes. Once water was diverted from the upper river, it dropped through the wheel pits and into the tail race with controlled gradient. At full capacity, the underground passages could move tens of thousands of cubic feet of water per second. Sustaining factories, streetcar systems, and entire grids across southern Ontario. So, through the first half of the 20th century, these tunnels were regarded as a model of efficient hydraulic engineering. But by the 1950s, the role of private hydro companies was shrinking rapidly. In short, Ontario's energy strategy shifted towards large public mega projects, most notably the Sir Adam Beck stations upriver. Their deeper tunnels, higher drop, and state managed water rights gave them a far greater output than that old Ontario plant ever could achieve. Furthermore, the cross-border treaties governing the flow further reduced the water allotment available to private operators. And although the Ontario Power Company kept producing into the 1990s, it was running on borrowed time. The equipment aged, efficiency dropped, and every year the plant looked more like a fading relic. By March the 15th, 1999, after 93 years of service, the station permanently shut down. The intakes were sealed with concrete and steel plates. The tail race entrances were closed and the tunnels were left to flood gradually under hydrostatic pressure. What we know today is that those tunnels remain submerged and structurally sound. As remote inspections conducted through access ports indicate that the brick-lined sections have held up very well. Above them, the Ontario Power Station still stands on the riverbank, a stark concrete building with its windows covered and machinery long removed. The next major tunnel complex to emerge at Niagara came about in 1905, when work on the Toronto Power Tail Race began. The construction crews mainly consisted of immigrant laborers, Italians, Poles, and Hungarians, who worked long shifts, blasting and drilling by lantern light. Progress was slow, but steady. When the tunnel was finally finished in 1907, it stretched over 2,200 feet below the landscape. Once again, following a carefully calculated slope that allowed the water to flow out of the turbines and smoothly towards the river. This tunnel's profile reflected the engineering philosophies of the period. It had a rounded, brick-lined arch for most of its length with exposed dolomite in sections where the rock proved stable enough. Workers installed this lining one course at a time, gradually building up the curvature to reduce turbulence and prevent erosion from the constant discharge. At the upstream end, 
the tail rays connected to the draft tubes beneath the turbines. At the downstream end, it emerged through a wide stone portal cut directly into the gorge wall. Now, above this hidden structure was a striking example of Beaux-Arts architecture, the Toronto Power Generating Station, featuring its limestone facade, tall arched windows, and symmetrical design. In fact, it was one of the most elegant industrial buildings ever constructed at the falls, and for nearly 70 years, it performed without major interruption. But this system's dominance also faded as the Sir Adam Beck complexes came online just upriver. From that point in time, its output dwindled over the decades until 1974 when the plant closed for good. History repeated itself here as workers sealed tunnels and without the flow, sediment began to settle along the floor. For decades, inspections were rare. All we really knew was that the tunnel remained an inaccessible cavity beneath an empty powerhouse. But then, the story changed in 2021, when the Niagara Parks Commission launched a restoration project. Crews entered the tunnel for the first time in decades. They cleared debris, reinforced weakened sections, and installed a walkway above the original floor. By 2023, the entire length of the tail race opened as a public attraction. What remains today is one of the most intact examples of early hydroelectric tunneling in North America. Visitors can actually walk through the tunnel's original brick arch, seeing firsthand the alignment of the discharge passage. Furthermore, they can stand at the portal where the water once thundered into the gorge. This was the most amazing outcome of all the tunnels we've talked about today. However, the next one, the final one, is by all counts, the most devastating. The Shokoff power station grew in stages between 1904 and 1924, with each expansion adding new sections of underground tunnel. By the time the final generating houses were completed, the plant had become the most powerful installation on the American side of the river. And importantly, its subterranean works were far more complex than those earlier plants. Across the upper plateau, workers excavated wide intake conduits that channeled water towards the drop point. From there, angled penstocks, some descending more than 150 feet, delivered the flow down the gorge wall and into the turbines. Then, beneath the powerhouse floor, a network of tail race tunnels carried the discharge water towards the lower river. Sections of these tunnels were tall enough for workers to walk through upright. Others were carved into narrow bedrock passages, accessible only by smaller maintenance crews. Unlike the single-purpose tunnels we previously covered, this was a true underground network, with each generating house feeding into a shared discharge passage. This was revolutionary, as the station could run multiple units at the same time without backflow or bottlenecks. The scale was unprecedented for its time, and the design pushed the limits of early 20th century engineering. For three decades, it functioned as intended and supplied electricity all across western New York. Its end, however, came with almost no warning. On the afternoon of June the 7th, 1956, workers noticed a small seep of water emerging through the retaining wall behind the station. At first, they thought it seemed like a common drainage issue, but within hours, the seep became a crack, and the crack widened into a structural failure. This is when the gorge wall itself began to shift. Sections of rock sheared away, undermining the penstocks anchor to the cliff face as the workers made the horrifying realization that they were in the midst of a collapse. The steel penstocks tore from their mountings, ripping open the station floor, and in the process, sent water pouring into the underground works. Over the course of just hours, three generating houses, 3A, 3B, and 3C, were completely destroyed. Some parts fell into the river, others were crushed under the sliding rock. Whereas below ground, the tail race tunnels flooded instantly, and to catastrophic effect. Needless to say, this plant never reopened. The disaster became one of the most consequential moments in Niagara's industrial history, as its destruction accelerated America's decision to centralize hydroelectric generation in a single public facility. Which is why within just a few years, construction began on the Robert Moses Niagara Power Plant located upriver. Today, the remains of Shokoff exist at surface level. These are scars like broken stone walls clinging to the gorge, staircases that now lead to empty platforms, and markers identifying the footprint of the lost powerhouse. But if you're asking about the tunnels, well, those are long gone. And that's the story of the abandoned tunnels at Niagara Falls. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, 
consider supporting the channel by clicking subscribe. Otherwise, until next time, this is Ryan Sokash, signing off.